I get frequently asked about the very beginnings of the band Deep Purple. And although I was there very, very early, I wasn't there right at the very beginning. Uh, I got a lot of this from what John told me, and some from Richie. But there was a guy by the name of Chris Curtis, and he was a drummer with The Searchers, a very successful band that came out of the, the Liverpool boom with the Beatles and all those other bands from that time. And uh, he had found three guys who were not involved in the entertainment industry, uh, but were bored with their jobs. They were all very successful. One was in frozen foods, one was in advertising, and one was in the fashion industry. And they wanted a change of lifestyle. So they thought, well, we'll become uh, theatrical managers, entertaining managers, you know. Uh, and that's what they did. Chris found them and he managed to convince them that he was the guy to put a band together and he would just need some funding, which they provided. Well, Chris got Richie and John together uh, and explained to them his vision of what the band was going to be. Well, Chris was going to be the singer. Um, when he wasn't singing, he was going to play drums. And occasionally he would play guitar, keyboards, bass. You know, he would do everything. Well, <laughs> they knew he could play drums, and I'm not sure how well. And then he knew he could sing a bit, because he was part of the, the harmony thing on stuff the searchers did. Um, but I don't know if he could play any of the other stuff, the guitars and keyboards and stuff. But that was, that was his vision. And he wanted to treat, treat it like a, a roundabout. In America, a traffic circle. You get on, stay as long as you needed to, and then get off. So there'd be a, an inflow and outflow of musicians. Well, this was pie in the sky, you know. It just doesn't work like that. And uh, uh, Richie and John apparently <laughs> realized he'd lost touch with reality completely and sort of promoted him sideways, like these hands, going out of the picture. Uh, but John and Richie liked the idea of working together and they convinced the three businessmen. No point in naming them, you know, this is about the band, it's not about them. Uh, to continue funding the band, which is what they did. Uh, it's well known that uh, Rod Evans, a singer with me in in the maze, uh, answered an advert in the Melody Maker for a new band requiring a singer, went along and Richie had remembered him from a year before when we'd played in Hamburg and uh, asked Rod to bring me along to see if it would work out. Uh, John had been playing uh, in a band with Nicky Simper, who was already the bass player for the band. And so when I came along after Rod, that was it the nucleus was formed. We still hadn't got a name. You know. It was still sort of, the roundabout thing was still hanging on because nobody could think of anything better. So we had a piece of paper on the wall in this farmhouse that we were renting. There's another story. Uh, and in the morning, if anybody had an idea, they'd write it down on the wall. Um, and one day there was the name Deep Purple written there. And it's so long ago, I try hard to remember everything, but uh, anyway, uh, we think it was Richie, uh, and Richie thinks it was Richie. Uh, uh, he had an auntie who used to play piano, and the song by Nino Tempo and April Stevens, Deep Purple, When the Deep Purple Falls, that one, uh, she used to like playing it on the piano. And that's why I don't remember Richie said the last piano, piano piece she ever played for, she died. Now, knowing Richie's sense of humour, I don't know whether to take that as the truth or not. Anyway, out of all the other possibilities, that looked like it could be a name. It was a role to band's name at the time. You had Rolling Stones, Falling Leaves, uh, Black Sabbath. Well, they weren't there yet, but they were coming. So there was a you know, deep purple. There was like a a two-word uh, title for the bands, and that 
seemed to make sense, you know, it's got to be called something. And that was better than anything else. But when we did our first gig, which uh, again came through a, a friend of John's, who's a little promoter in Denmark by the name of Walter Klebel, uh, John got in touch and said, look, we've got this new band, we want to try it out. Uh, we're not sure what's going to happen yet, but if you can put two or three gigs together, uh, we're happy to come over there and, and play for next to nothing, just see how it's working out. So Walter did the job he was good at and found two or three shows for us to play. And the first one was in a little town just outside Copenhagen called Tastrup. It's still there. Um, and we did the, the first show there. Uh, and that was fine. But the trip to Denmark didn't actually start out very, very well. In those days, the UK was not in the European Economic Union. Uh, so we were real foreigners as far as they were concerned. You know, we had to have work permits and visas and all that stuff to get in the country to do what we wanted to do. Well, Walter had uh, got everything in place. We just hadn't got it to the authorities in Esberg, where we landed on the boat from England. So we got there and the passports were all checked and they said, where's your work permits? And we said, well, you should have them. And they said, we don't have anything. And this went on for 10 or 15 minutes. They said, oh, okay, you're gonna have to stay here till we sort this out. Now, where they kept people, uh, while well, they did sort these things out, was quite a long way in the docks, quite a long way from where you show your passport. And the only transport they had for us uh, was their dog car, <laughs> where they carried the, the sniffer dogs. Uh, so we were bundled in the back of this car, in the bit where the dogs go behind the, the mesh, and carted off to this holding area while they sorted out the, uh, the work permits. They came through and we, we got away in the end, but it wasn't a great start. Uh, anyway, uh, I don't remember much more about that little trip, other than the fact we, we did those few shows and we proved to ourselves that not only could we play together, we played quite well together. And people seemed to like it, even though most of the stuff we were doing were cover songs. We, we, we had very little in the way of original music. It wasn't, we didn't have the ability at that time to create lots of new songs. But that was the, that was the start of it. Uh, I'll go back to where we were staying at the time, rehearsing and trying to get it together. It was a farmhouse to the north of London, uh, and it was called Deves Hall. And uh, we got it very, very cheap because <laughs> uh, the owner was renovating it at the same time we were there. And there were two builders there. I, I still remember Bob and Ray. I don't know why I remember this stuff. It's... But there you go. And every, every morning we come down, the equipment, equipment had been moved to another room because the room it was in would, was not there. <laughs> the floor had gone or the wall had been taken out. Uh, so that was, that was quite something, but we managed to get it done. Uh, I remember so many, so many of those things from that, that first six months. But what I remember is a fraction of what I've forgotten. Anyway, that's how it started. Uh, we're gone to what happened next, or sometime after that, next time I sit at this bar and have another drink with you. Cheers.